The National Defence Strategy states, and I quote, China has employed coercive tactics in pursuit of its strategic objectives, including forceful handling of territorial disputes and unsafe intercepts of vessels and aircraft operating in international waters and airspace in accordance with international law. Australia no longer has the luxury of a 10-year window of strategic warning time for conflict. The National Defence Strategy observes that the combined effect of this has seen our strategic environment deteriorate over the last 12 months. And against this strategic backdrop, the National Defence Strategy emphasises the need for impactful projection that can enable a strategy of denial which in turn is capable of deterring a potential adversary from projecting force against Australia. This includes the capability to hold the military assets of an adversary at risk at greater distance from our shores. Equally important, this strategy aims to ensure that Australia can work with our partners to help deter broader conflict in our region that would be disastrous for us all. And in this way, the government seeks to invest in a sustainable strategic balance in the Indo-Pacific, a balance where no state is militarily predominant and in which no state judges that the benefit of conflict might outweigh the risks. People are defence's most important asset. And like many other Australian industries, we face a profound workforce challenge. Between 2021 and 2022-23, Defence achieved only 80 per cent of its uniformed recruiting requirements. And when combined with a strong external labour market draw for our people, this has resulted in a shortfall of around 4,400 personnel today. Now, of course, we are focused on attracting and retaining the highly specialised and skilled workforce required to meet Defence's capability needs. And this is not easy in a highly competitive labour market with record low levels of unemployment. There have been fundamental shifts already to make Defence an employer of choice. We are investing more in the education of our ADF personnel through the Defence Assisted Study Scheme and have expanded the ADF Health Program to include additional services. We've also introduced $50,000 continuation bonuses to encourage personnel to stay in the ADF beyond their minimum service obligation requirements. The government acknowledges the importance of addressing cultural shortcomings within defence, including those highlighted in the 2020 Inspector General of the ADF Afghanistan inquiry. The government will also consider the findings of the forthcoming final report of the Royal Commission into Defence and Veteran Suicide which will include informing strategies to improve defence's culture. And we've taken meaningful steps to address defence's workforce crisis, but there is more work to do to improve recruitment and retention and to ensure defence's workforce planning is informed by our capability requirements. Defence will undertake a new comprehensive workforce plan that will be aligned with the National Defence Strategy and the Integrated Investment Program one that will deliver an effective and achievable approach to workforce planning. This plan will look to how we can streamline recruiting processes and have them more focused on the skills that Defence needs the most. It will look at ways we can retain existing personnel for longer. Significantly, it will look at how the ADF can recruit from a wider pool of people. And this means ensuring that defence reflects the full diversity of Australia, such that it is drawing on the talents of the entirety of Australian society. But like the defence forces of our friends and allies, we also need to look at ways in which we can recruit from among certain non-Australian citizens to serve in the ADF. As a government, we are committed to meeting the current and future needs of the defence workforce, whether that be our ADF, Australian Public Service or external workforce. 